Hello, dear friends. How are you this week? I have been wandering still since we last spoke. Wandering, walking, exploring. It is still covered in snow, this forest, so I don't recognize anything. But the emptiness has been good for my mind, I think. Looking at only white snow gives my imagination something to paint against. I have a strange memory of running down a grassy hill, laughing at the way my feet were out of control, a little frightened at the idea of falling and tumbling, but knowing that that would be a great kind of fun too, so not too afraid of it. Whatever happened to that feeling? I wonder when I'll be able to feel that again. One day soon, I'm certain. It is something I think I can actively strive for. We'll see. I miss it, wherever that memory is coming from. My heart has felt especially tender lately, because I think I have been alone here with no one to care for. Isn't that strange? I have helped creatures in my woods, human or elemental or deceased or otherwise, and I have seen them love me for it, even when they are afraid of me. That is something, too. But lately, it's just me and this snow. What can I love here? I can love everything. I do love everything. I love the world, and the people, and creatures, and things that come out of it. I do. But how can I show it? If love is a verb, how do I do that, in such a lonely place as this? A good question for my cards. I sat in the snow, and for a moment... I was certain I was in a completely different place than I was before, since it was simply too white all around. The presence of nothingness here was a little too intense, more intense than I remembered it being before. Oh well. I shuffled. I cut the deck. I pulled from the top. The Page of Swords. Now what joy you see because the Page of Swords is curiosity, and I love curiosity. It is also youthfulness, action on new ideas, rebellion, strong choices in a new and unusual direction, perhaps. Not simply manifesting one's desires through will alone, but also taking actionable steps towards a huge change. Walking right towards that change, whether one is afraid or not. It teaches us to follow our joy and our passion, to find out where our truth really lies. I like that. I quite like that, actually. We must take leaps towards change, mustn't we? despite our fear, because of our fear, in order to overcome our fear. What is it that you want? I don't know what I want. I find myself here, in this beautiful and empty place, and I find myself dissatisfied. What is the difference between here and between where I want to be. Nothing. I don't know if I would know heaven if I saw it, so what does it matter where I am? And so I must love where I am, but how? Through running gleefully and desperately and bravely towards change, towards those ideas that stick in the corner of your heart and won't leave you alone towards those thoughts that make you entirely you. That is what I must do. 
the thing that I love, the best way that I love, the way I show my love, for the world, for you, but mostly for myself, is, I think, through stories. So I shall easily start there tonight. But I will keep the page of swords in my mind and heart even after that, because change is a guaranteed and constant companion. And I think this page tells us best how to greet change, or at least how to greet the desire for change, which is also extremely, inherently good. That is how we can best love the world. And we are a part of the world, and so, therefore, ourselves, too, by following our heart in the gentlest and most peaceful way toward the change we want. And so I have a story for you. Ready? Once upon a time, a frustrated lioness paced a tiny cage in a city zoo. She had been born and raised in captivity, the poor thing. I can't say how I feel about the concept in any time period, but in this particular time period in which our story takes place, zoos were certainly quite different than what they are now. And unfortunately for this feline, she had been moved from one zoo to another, from public centers to private menageries, in her young lifetime. This particular establishment she lived in now was a very beautiful but very cruel kind of place. The cages were decorated with fine statues and shining bars on the outside, but on the inside they were small and empty. They were designed for people to be able to see the animals up close, with nowhere for them to run or hide if they weren't feeling particularly sociable. No attempt was made to make these things seem anything close to natural for the beasts within their bars. And that is where this lion had spent the last few years. But she was a clever beast, this lion. She had spent so long living among humans and watching them from very close that she had secretly begun to learn their ways. She watched the way they moved the way they smiled, the way they frowned. She heard the way their voices changed with the way they were feeling or who they were addressing. She watched the way they ate, the way they sat down. She even began to understand their language, little by little, because she had simply decided to do it. And she had a plan. I cannot say by what magic, by the magic of a particularly bright and full moon one evening, perhaps? Or maybe the granting of a wish by a passing angel or demon? Or perhaps it was simply by the sheer force of her own will? For who are we to have any understanding of the power of the will of a beast as mighty as a lion? Whatever magic it was, one night she closed her eyes and she squeezed her mouth shut, and she stifled her roars and screams and whimpers as her body shifted and twisted and changed. I am strong. I am powerful. I am a lion, she thought to herself, and it made the pain seem much more bearable as it happened. In the morning, the shaking young man who came every day to feed the beasts arrived and approached the bars. But when he saw a young woman sitting in the cage, wrapped in the finely crafted skin of a lioness, staring at him with unflinching, determined eyes, the tray of raw meat in his hands fell crashing to the ground. Well... The young woman said to him, a pleasant rumble in her throat as she smiled. Don't you think you ought to let me out? 
and so he did. She had her fair share of challenges, sure, but she was a clever and charismatic young lady who easily moved her way into human society. She knew enough to claim that she had been injured and lost her memory, and she was so beguiling and charming that no one disbelieved her. She was so fierce and so proud that no one dared harm her. She walked into buildings and demanded assistance, and everyone gave it because surely she was nobility. The way she held herself, the bright and eager city all around her was so eager to call her a lost princess, a forgotten baroness, or some other such nonsense. Though she spent one or two nights and days at the local police station, Word made it to the town crier and gossips about the strange and mysterious lady who was found in a lion's cage. It was a story unlike any other. No one even bothered to wonder where the lost lion had gone. Soon, offers from members of high society came pouring in. People of high standing eager to shelter her and feed her and give her fine clothes and baubles— and thus endear themselves to society even further. She knew their games. She had been sold from zoo to zoo her entire life, after all. So now she decided to trade herself. She gladly took everything they offered her. The talk of the town and soon the toast of the town. The fine lady was the ultimate ornament one might have at their party. Dukes, duchesses and soon even princes and queens were requesting she come to their home for balls that lasted as long as five days sometimes. And for a while, perhaps a few months, perhaps a year, maybe, it was everything she had ever dreamed of. Freedom, joy, delight. She had so wanted to be a human all those years that she had been locked in by them. She had yearned for their power, their hunger. She yearned for all of the amazing devices and inventions and decorations they surrounded themselves with. She had spent so much time smelling their strange and unusual food. She had spent her life as a very curious young cat. And she was curious still. She had a lust for life and for decadence that everyone around her adored trying to satiate. But soon, it started to lose its glow. Soon, she found herself hungry again, but she didn't know what for. In her own room in the grandest hotel in the city, a gift from a wealthy admirer, no doubt. She looked down at the streets below and heard carriage wheels screeching and horses' shoes clacking against the stone. And she felt the strangest desire to chase it. How strange, she thought to herself. And it was strange, for she had lived her whole life growing accustomed to the sound of passing carriages, even as a cub in a cage. Born in captivity, as I said, she had never actually hunted before a day in her life, and so it was not an instinct based in physical memory. And now that she was an adult human, she had ridden in so many carriages she had lost count. but never had she felt anything close to a hunter's instinct at the sight or sound of these animals. Never. But tonight? Oh, she wanted to chase that beast through the streets, into the woods, through the trees, and then... No. She shook her head and rubbed her eyes. I'm just tired. 
and a knock at the door announced the arrival of the brand new dress she was going to wear tonight. To the masquerade ball she had been looking forward to all week. But now that it was here, all she could think about was chasing, hunting, feeding. She arrived late, of course, and when her name was announced, a name she had accepted and not chosen, for it made little difference to her what these creatures wanted to call her, the entire crowd gasped and applauded at her appearance. It was a masquerade ball, so of course most people arrived in costumes inspired by animals. And she knew that they loved her as a sweet and lovely thing that needed their help. So she dressed in all white, with soft, light fabric bunched about her like sparkling, gleaming sheep's wool. And she wore a great white powdered wig, glittering with crystals and little flowers. Her mask was white as ivory. She was a lamb, a lamb lost in the wild at the end of winter, perhaps. Lovely, she knew, but entirely false. Everyone wanted to dance with her. She spent the night dancing with lords and ladies of the court, one after the other, disappointing desperate followers everywhere she went. But she noticed one man there who was not approaching her. He was watching from a distance, dancing with no one, leaning against a wall. He wore a suit of grey, with a great, long coat trimmed in fur. He had, from what she could see, long black hair, streaked here and there with white and grey too, tied back behind him. A full beard, a little unusual especially for the time and the place. And the mask he wore on his face had a long snout, a black nose, and huge ears, and big, white fangs. He was perhaps as beguiling to her as she was to everyone else. He watched her and still did not move. She broke early from her current dance partner and went towards him. Hello, she said. He did not answer. Would you like to dance? She asked him. He did not answer. Who are you? She asked him. He inhaled and exhaled deeply. A stranger here, he said only and shrugged. Like you. Something about the way he said that frightened her. And lions don't frighten easily. He then moved close to her. He sniffed twice. <laughs> and scoffed. And then he left. She returned to her partner and finished her dance. But she couldn't forget what he had said. She left shortly after. All night she dreamed of running through a... What was it? Was it a forest? No, it was different. A jungle, perhaps. But she had never been to one before. A warm place with delicious, clean air and soft ground beneath her paws. She ran, she ran, and she ran until she was indeed in the nearby forest she knew, and then in the streets of the city she lived in, running freely on four legs. Oh, she loved it. She loved it. In fact, she had never run so much with her true legs in her whole life. She had never been given the space. 
birds, rats, horses, dogs, and even people, ran from her as she bolted at them. She did not even try to feed. She just wanted the joy of running and chasing. Delight. Delight unlike anything she had ever felt before. And when her eyes opened in the morning, she sorrowed for the lost dream. Her head ached. Her limbs were tired. Perhaps she had danced too late the night before, indulged too deeply in the food and the champagne. She spent the day resting and preparing for the next night of the masquerade. This night she wore another white gown, this one with feathers and another white mask, with little wings and a golden beak. She was a lovely partridge, a dove perhaps, complete with a sparkling bloody heart at her chest with a little golden arrow through it, a little brooch an empress gave her once. She arrived late, very easily disguising her fatigue and ennui. She danced all night. And then she saw the man in the corner once more. Her dignity kept her from approaching him. And as she stood in a circle of people who considered her to be a friend, a concept she didn't quite understand but was trying to embrace, one mentioned a frightful attack from a wild animal in the streets that had been the source of a great deal of chatter today. The lady in white stopped, still as stone. Indeed, they think it is a lion. Perhaps the very same that escaped from the zoo so long ago, eh? I heard it was a person, someone else said. Some mischief maker or other, I'm sure. <laughs> the lady excused herself. No, it was impossible, she thought. It was a dream, nothing more. A dream, nothing more. But it had felt so real. And it had felt so ecstatic. She ran outside to catch some fresh air on a nearby balcony. She tried to hold back panicked tears, and in so doing, she sniffed inward twice. <laughs> and for the first time, she took notice of a particular scent. Ever since she had taken on her human skin, she had ceased to pay attention to what her nose told her. But this scent. She looked up and saw the man in grey once more. He was watching her, and saying nothing. She watched him back, and said nothing. Neither of them moved. And for only a moment... She focused behind the holes in his mask through which she could see his icy blue eyes, and the door to the balcony opened from within as two laughing lovers roared on through. The door allowed the light from the crystal chandelier in the ballroom to shine out and across the man in Grey's face. And for a moment, those eyes reflected yellow back at her as the light passed over them. She backed away from him slowly, and then ran back to the place she called home, but knew wasn't. She slammed the door to her room behind her, and she locked it. She pushed the dresser in front of it. She tied her feet to the corners of the bed, all the while whispering over and over, Impossible. Impossible, impossible. And she tried not to sleep. But every time she blinked, she felt that warm breeze. She breathed that clean air. She felt that soft earth. And the dream, if that's what it was, overtook her. She ran. Oh, joy unlike any other. Oh, breath sweeter than any breath before. Oh, a night brighter than any other night. 
she chased whatever crossed her path. Her jaws snapped at screaming creatures. Creatures she wouldn't let slow her down for anything. Never mind the shouts of the human men in uniforms behind her. Never mind any of it. She ran and ran and ran. And when she saw the forest on the outskirts of the city, she ran there because she had had enough. Had enough of the failed experiment that was parties and hotels and champagne and cupcakes. She wanted the wilderness that was denied her. The grass under her feet. The moon over her head. The lost princess's true inheritance. When she made it to the forest, she fell to the ground and realized, slowly, that she stood on two legs, that she didn't have fur, that her white dress from the night before was torn all over from running on all fours. She had been human the whole time. There was no going back. Not ever. Shivering, her human eyes couldn't see in the dark. Except for those two glowing eyes, yellow, in the shadows of the trees. She panted, slowly trying to regain her pride, though she was frightened and weak with exhaustion. But even when frightened and weak with exhaustion, and wearing the guise of a dove, a lion is still a lion. She sniffed the air, and she smelled wolf. <laughs> she now knew exactly what the smell was, for she had relearned how to listen with her nose. So she opened her mouth wide and roared, and rushed at those eyes in the shadow, unafraid of death, unafraid of humanity, and unafraid of fear itself. She had thought to feel the jaws of the beast around her vulnerable human throat, but instead she felt arms catch her as she lunged. Gentle and large, wearing human skin and the very badly torn gray suit of a fine gentleman. There now. There you are. There you are. He said as she sobbed in his arms. His fur pelt she had always seen him wearing was intact, and she felt it against her fingertips. She understood. He was from the animal kingdom. Like her, he wore the mask of a human, a wolf in human's clothing, as it were. Have you met him before? I have. Years and years ago, he said, stroking her hair as they fell to the ground and mourned for their lost paws, their glorious coats. I made a mistake, and I was cursed to be this. But I still run, and I still chase. I cannot stop somehow. I never had this, she said mournfully, allowing herself to speak it in words for the first time. I never ran, and I never chased, but now that I have, I also cannot stop. 
he mourned with her for her lost years in a cage. He mourned with her for having cursed herself. Not only this, but for having no other choice but to curse herself like this. Wrapping themselves up as best as they could, and moving quickly in the early morning hours when everything was quiet, they went to her room, where they spoke for hours and hours on end. They spoke of times past and gone and therefore irrelevant. They spoke of humans and beasts and the very little difference between them after all. They spoke of the joy of running forever with their feet on real, true earth. The joy they knew they might only feel again rarely, if ever at all. For it was a difficult thing to find in a world such as this, even for animals, most unfortunately. They could come to no conclusions other than acceptance. They were what they were now. So what came next? A wolf trapped in a hell of sorts. A lion trapped in a heaven of sorts. Both of their own creation. Where could they go? They could not find the answer. For both of these things are final destinations, in a way. Are they not? The third night of the masquerade came to pass. And the guest of honor... The mysterious lady, the lost princess, the city loved so dear, was nowhere to be found. Guests nervously chattered within as music played impatiently. Standing outside were two figures. One, a man in grey, dressed as a wolf, just as he had done every night before. And the other, a woman wearing a great golden gown her long, unruly hair combed out into a great lion's mane, no longer in disguise. They looked in at the masquerade ball through its open doors and at the people dancing. People who thought that she was a mysterious princess and that he was a mysterious prince from two lost and ancient lands. But they were not. They were from right here, from a place that did not allow animals to run in the streets, even if it was just for the sheer delight of running. They looked at each other and smiled, and they walked away from the place. I don't know when they stopped walking, but I'm certain that two charismatic strangers such as themselves found their way through the world easily. They must have. What cannot a lion and a wolf accomplish, especially together? One night, I roamed a countryside, somewhere, swift as a breeze, my feet running and running and rejoicing in the brisk air. Until I stumbled on a little place, a little cottage with little candles set in the snow in the backyard. And two people, a man and a woman, wearing animal furs and torn silks, hair unruly and faces calm, danced a waltz together, their feet bare, their laughter musical. dream of running swift as a breeze through a world that can still be wild again one day. Good night, my friends.
Hi there, my friends, and thank you so much for listening in to episode 129 of On a Dark Cold Night. I'm Kristen Zaza, your host, writer, creator, composer, and podcaster behind the show. I hope you're having a good week and getting through this last push of January. I know I've needed to be a bit more gentle with myself lately, so I hope you have been doing the same. We deserve it, right? Right. First, I'd like to send a very big thank you to two new patrons of the show who pledged a monthly amount supporting On a Dark Cold Night through Patreon.com. So big thanks going out to John Koch and to Bobby Cardozo. Thank you so much, John and Bobby. I'm so grateful that you enjoy what I do and want to help me create it. Every monthly Patreon supporter of On a Dark Cold Night receives access to my ever-evolving soundtrack of the show. If you're interested in this and would like to learn more, head on over to patreon.com slash darkcoldnight to check it out. You are also welcome to contribute instead via coffee.com if you'd prefer to make a one-time contribution instead. So you can learn more at ko-fi.com slash darkcoldnight. And we've also got t-shirts and hoodies available for purchase. You can head on over to bonfire.com slash on dash a dash dark dash cold dash night to see those. A great way to support the show without getting financially involved is to leave a rating and a review over iTunes, Stitcher, my Facebook page, or anywhere else you like to rate podcasts. That would be fantastic. You can also follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter at a dark cold night, Instagram at dark cold night podcast, or on my Facebook or YouTube pages just called On a Dark Cold Night. Good night, dear friends. I wonder what animal's eyes you'd like to see the world through tonight, if you could choose. A pleasant thought to consider, as you drift off, maybe. Sweet dreams, my friends. Take care. This podcast has been brought to you by the Sonar Network. Sonar.